Good evening. This is Sleep Chamber, the podcast that doesn't have any agenda but to help you fall asleep. If I can offer any advice on how to deal with my podcast, it's this. Don't take it too seriously. Just use my voice either way you see fit. You don't even have to listen if you don't want. Just zone out. I promise I won't feel bad if you do. My name is Henrik. I'm not from where you live, probably. And I'm going to talk like this for about an hour. So now you know. It is what it is. What happens, happens. And as for now, there's nothing we can do. It was a dark and stormy night, and I was all alone walking through the city. The rain was coming down hard, and the wind was blowing through the streets. I felt so alone and lost, and I didn't know where to go or what to do. I just kept walking, hoping that someone would come and find me. But no one did. I eventually found myself at the edge of the city, and I just sat down and cried. I felt so hopeless and helpless, and I didn't know what to do. But then I heard a voice in the distance, and it was coming closer. I looked up and saw a light, and I knew that someone had finally come for me. Then I saw the most beautiful angel I had ever seen. She was coming towards me, and I felt like everything was going to be all right. She took me in her arms and told me that I was never alone, and that she would always be there for me. Then she took me away to a place where I would never be lonely or lost again. As of that day, I never walked alone through the city at night again. Because I knew that my angel was always with me. Before that night, I never believed in angels. But now I know that they are real and that they are always watching over us. The thing is, sometimes we just need a little help to find our way back home. Perhaps you're feeling lost and alone right now. But don't give up hope. Because there is an angel out there who is looking for you. And when you finally find each other, you'll know that everything is going to be all right. My angel found me when I needed her the most. And she'll find you too. Someone is always looking for you. Never give up hope. Life is full of hardships and struggles. But it's also full of love and hope. And if you just keep moving forward, you'll eventually find your way back home.
If you're feeling lost and alone, don't give up. Because someone is looking for you. I keep thinking about that dark and stormy night and how lost and alone I felt. But I also think about my angel and how she came and found me. And I know that if she can find me, she can find anyone. So never give up hope. Because an angel is always watching over you. But it's not just angels who are looking for us. We are also looking for each other. So if you're feeling lost, don't give up. Because someone out there is looking for you. They're looking for you, just like you're looking for them. For we are all lost souls, searching for someone to bring us back home. You might say that you're not lost, but we all are in some way. We're all searching for something. And when we find it, we'll know that we're finally home. But what is this thing that we're searching for? I'm not sure, but I think it might be love. Because when we find love, we find ourselves. And when we find ourselves, we find home. So never give up hope. Because someone is always looking for you. And when you find each other, you'll finally be home. So never give up hope. Because love is always worth the search. I've been through a lot of tough times in my life. But I've also been through a lot of good times. And I know that no matter how bad things get, they always get better. Because there's always someone out there who is looking for you. So never give up hope. Because things will always get better. And never forget that you're never alone. Because someone is always looking for you. Not just angels, but people too. So if you're feeling lost and alone, don't give up. Because someone out there is looking for you. They're looking for you, just like you're looking for them. For we are all lost souls, searching for someone to bring us back home. You might say that you're not lost, but we all are in some way. We're all searching for something. And when we find it, we'll know that we're finally home. But what is this thing that we're searching for? I'm not sure. But I think it might be love. Because when we find love, we find ourselves. And when we find ourselves, we find home. So never give up hope. Because someone is always looking for you.
So never give up hope, because love is always worth the search. My neighbor Eric is always out walking his dog, no matter what the weather is like. And I often see him walking through the city at night. I asked him why he does it, and he said that he's looking for someone. Who are you looking for? I asked him. I'm looking for someone who is lost and alone, he said. I'm looking for someone who needs someone to find them. I'm looking for someone who is searching for someone to bring them back home. And have you found anyone? I asked him. Yes, he said. I've found many people. And I always will. Because that's what I do. I walk through the city at night, looking for someone who needs me. And that's when I realized that we're all looking for someone. We're all searching for someone to bring us back home. So never give up hope, because someone is always looking for you. Okay, so this is getting long, so I'll stop here. But I just wanted to say that if you're feeling lost and alone, don't give up hope. Because someone is always looking for you. And when you find each other, you'll finally be home. I never used to think much about where I came from. I grew up in a comfortable middle-class family and had a pretty good life. I never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from, whether I would have a roof over my head or if I would be safe and sound. I'm not saying that I was spoiled or anything like that. I just had a different perspective on the world because I always had a buffer. But one day, my perspective changed. I had an apartment, a job, and a car. I had a driver's license, a college degree, and a good credit score. And then, all of a sudden, I had none of those things. So, I went to that agency to try to find a job. At the time, I couldn't tell you exactly what the agency was, but I know it was something like the agency where I got my first real job, which was a staffing agency. I was hired by a professional staffing agency, and it was through them that I landed a decent job with the Pittsburgh District Attorney. In essence, I became an undercover law enforcement agent. My first official day on the job was August 11, 2008. My life was pretty routine up until that point. I spent my days hunched over my desk doing my job for the DAW, taking calls, piping, transcribing, filing, and working on anything related to my work. On the weekends, I watched sports and drank with my friends. While I was in line, a plainclothes security guy came up and asked for my identification. I'm from work, I said. 
I work for a fucked up agency. What are you doing here? He asked. I couldn't reply. Cause I don't know what I am doing here. None of us really do. I came to work one day and there was a message from an acquaintance that was asking for my number. I told her I didn't have a cell phone. She told me she would call the police and have them come and seize my phone and all the money I had on it, and I would have to give it to her if I wanted to receive the call. That's crazy, I said. I'm calling the police. If you don't give it to me, they'll have to come and get it, she replied. I was skeptical. My impulse was to call the police myself and turn myself in, but I decided to wait. A couple days later, I had become an orphan. Yes, I had a mother who loved me and my two siblings. And yes, I had a father who loved us, too. He was a hard worker, very kind and very ambitious. He was ambitious because he believed that if he worked hard enough, he could provide a better life for us. But then, one night, he wasn't able to provide those things for us anymore. He was useless. My childhood became nothing more than a lie. Every day I woke up, I had a certain set of expectations about how the day would play out. And then, suddenly, I didn't have those expectations anymore. I woke up every morning with absolutely no idea of how the day would unfold. I had no idea how I was going to make ends meet. I had no idea how I was going to pay my bills. I had no idea how I was going to survive. That day I had never thought would happen to me. I realized that things were about to get a lot harder. I didn't have any family, so I didn't have a support system. I didn't have any money, so I was stuck in a city full of people that didn't care about me. I didn't know how to find a job or pay for things, so I was getting robbed at gunpoint every other day. It was also overwhelming, and I felt completely alone. I didn't have any family, so what was I supposed to do? After a month or two of barely surviving, I walked into an unemployment office. Looking back, I know it sounds crazy. But I really did it. I wanted to find a way to keep working and to help my friends. I became homeless about two years ago, and now I live in a homeless shelter in Orlando, Florida. I'm doing okay. I'm probably not going to starve to death or go to jail anytime soon but my life hasn't been easy. My biggest struggle is finding enough money to buy food. I'm living with a family that accepts me for who I am. 
but it doesn't make a big difference because I still can't find a job. And I'm one of the lucky ones. Many homeless people I've talked to say that there's more than enough food to go around in Orlando, but there's no way they can get to it. The poor face a world that's different from the one I grew up in. Money and fame and fortune are nice and all, but they do not solve the big problems in our lives. Happiness and security are not worth having, but it can be nice to get them from time to time. That said, once you make it out into the real world, you'll realize that the only thing you really need to be happy is the freedom to be yourself. That is all we need. That's all we are. She is not a woman who chose the traditional path. This is the story of the story that will never be told. This is the story of a girl who dared to dream. This is the story of the girl who lived a life with unlimited opportunities. Do not hold on to me and do not forsake me, for surely you made me for myself and for my glory. Before you created me in the womb, I knew you. Before you cast me out into the darkness of the world, I knew you. Before you slandered me with false accusations, I knew you. Before you said you would abandon me, I knew you. I am some girl who dared to dream. This is the story that will never be told. This is the story of a girl who dared to dream. This is the story of the girl who lived a life with unlimited opportunities. This is the story of a girl who dared to dream. In a kingdom far beyond the rim, two young brothers were about to be parted forever, each of them in dread and despair of what they knew was going to happen. King Palandria had failed to keep his promise to King Happel, a treaty they'd made long ago to ensure the power of the second court over the seventh court, while King Happel and his first court had failed to keep their promise to King Palandria to never ally with the third court. They'd come a long way to reach this place, but now they were faced with what they'd hoped was an imaginary future, that of a powerful alliance with all the various court leaders of all the courts. But here they stood, with the first court, and the second court to the north, and the third court to the south, and everything they believed they knew and loved being ripped apart by the costliest betrayal and treachery ever perpetrated, by a prince and princess of the third court. In a kingdom far beyond the rim, in a kingdom far beyond the edge, in a kingdom far beyond the edges of this world, the castle stood, shrouded in darkness. I've recently acquired a copy of an ancient playbook. The game is called Fatal Mistakes. The rules of the game is instructive. One is instructed to drop the floor with a spear in his hands. Next he is told to slash with a sword, without holding it. In the same manner, he is instructed to tap the ground with his foot to destroy a dream. All this is done without placing an obstacle in the way of his enemy. 
In the first round of play, he is told to land on the heads of both opposing players. Afterwards, he is to knock them over with a stick in the feet. All this is repeated in the same manner over and over. At the end of the round, the winner goes forward, and when the dust has cleared, he is notified of who has been defeated and who is the victor. Now how will this serve as entertainment? Because we are not yet ready to rise above the animalistic levels of competition and aggression, which make us seek to destroy our fellow men. When that time comes, we are ready. My dear youngsters, keep your eyes on the ball. Connection audiobooks present. My Spring Break by Lucas Barrymore. Dear Diary, My life is a mess. The mid season finale. I do not think that I could have had more homework than I have now. Oh, no, my parents have set a date for us to go to Disneyland. My friends and I are totally excited. We talked to Becky about it, and she thinks it's a wonderful opportunity for us. We talked to Erica about it, too, and she really thinks it's the right decision. I do not see why my parents were making such a big deal about this. I am really excited to go. We did ask Erica if we could invite her and Aiden. She did not think so. Oh, well. At least Erica thinks it's a fun idea. Erica is a very destructive human being with a lot of aggression. My parents are taking us to Disneyland. I am so excited. I think that I can talk about this to Dad. I talked to him, and he thought it was a good idea. We are also going to start homeschooling my brothers. Because of the issues with Erica. Our old teacher is retired, and we just found out that she is living in Tennessee. What a total loser. It's amazing how fast we got into homeschooling. I just had a discussion about it with Aiden. I really wanted to talk to Becky about it. I do not know if she did, but I am not going to bother her again. Becky is still in California with Aiden. Aiden will be returning soon. We are still in California. I wonder what Erica is doing. What dark deeds. We did have a good talk. I just hope she does not turn into a balloon. Balloons are still visiting us in our dreams. The kids are still very excited about Disneyland. We can't wait. I am excited, too. Aiden is also going to get to go. 
He really does love that park. We went to the amusement park last year on my spring break. Aiden was so happy that he did not go on any of the scary rides. He was scared that we would all get hurt. Aiden is a little bit younger than me, so he can do a lot of the rides that I cannot do. I can't believe how excited I am about Disneyland. I cannot believe that we have never been to Disneyland before. I think that I am going to make our spring break trip a very special one. Erica appears to be a balloon now. Here's your weekly dive into deep state actions. Rodents and rats may be more valuable than birds when identifying who's really winning the war on balloons. From balloon seizures by U.S. authorities to the black market around the Philippines, animals don't seem to be part of the solution. From the Philippines to Africa and from balloon seizures to toy smugglers, animals seem to be victims of the same long-term strategy as birds and mammals. And while toy dealers might be passing messages through rats, they don't seem to be trusting them for anything else. I'm left wondering if rat owners will eventually give up their rats and start training them as spies. And finally, pelicans are such losers. According to the pelican rights advocates working in the area, Armchair Village is the largest balan and unsmuggling area in Cambodia. And these pelicans, the ones often seen landing at the thousands of shrimp farms in the region, would most likely be far more accurate at predicting the ultimate toy than the U.S. Treasury Department. As you can see, the pelican is more focused on having a good day than the biggest part of the U.S. Treasury Department. Although pelicans sometimes struggle with what to do with all the helium they're rummaging through, that's not an issue for the pelican that was filmed by two Vietnamese tourists. Although there are plenty of successful dog spies and plenty of successful pelicans, no humans seem to be doing very well at their job. At all. Owl City. What a dark place in the woods. Where were your sweet peas? Why were you using that special stone of yours? The stones of Hawkwood are usually found on the stones of other lands, so why couldn't you find them on the stones of Ravenwood? Your pea flowers will never grow here or grow in your garden. What's happening with your sweet peas? Is your moon pendant damaged? Can you show me that stone of yours, or will I have to dig up the sweet pea beds to find it? The superhero best suited for housework is probably Iron Man. Maybe. Why not give Tony Stark the leg up when housework calls? He can fly up to his roof to scoop up cat litter and dispose of it. One more thing. Iron Man also makes an extra good dust buster. He's made from carbon fiber and can withstand over 500 pounds of impact force. A more likely candidate is Superman, 
who is also strong enough to lift a car. But might also be out of reach if his superpowers change. Superman's weight in pounds is listed as 447, meaning he'd have to carry around roughly three of Tony Stark's armor suits and rockets to get all the dirt down the basement stairs. One thing Superman would not be strong enough to do is shoot smoke into the living room while cleaning. This is something Iron Man can do. In fact, Iron Man can see through walls. If Superman has been kicking butt and taking names, why aren't you cleaning? Call me, I'll be in the garage. When two boxers meet on the street, their hands automatically clasp as if they knew they would meet again on the ring, like old friends, making the moment even more precious. It would be like that if Andy and Davy ended up meeting again on the ring. Andy wished this were true. His heart ached, and there was not a lot he could do about it. Late in the afternoon, Andy walked home in a gloomy mood. He was tired from his hard day at work and was thinking about the fun Davy must be having back in Vermont. How could they possibly work together now, given the growing distance between them? How could he stand going back to his own house, to be alone with his heart in turmoil over Andy and Davy? Maybe Davy didn't know how close he and Andy had been, or maybe he was too caught up in his own happiness to even notice how precious their friendship was to Andy. That night Andy dreamed of Davy at his camp, talking about the things Andy missed about him, bringing out a photo album and showing Andy pictures from Andy's boyhood, revealing Davy's dad, Jim, and showing Andy pictures of Andy's parents, and talking about how he missed them. When Andy woke up in the early morning, he could see Davy as if he was right in front of him. He hugged him with his eyes still shut and thought about how much he would miss him but would still love him in spite of that. There was an old lady in Kansas City who worshipped Maria Callas when she stood alone in the midst of her grief. Her long hair draped like a rich veil. That woman suffered like the whole world. To hear the news of her death gave her tears that fell down to the walls that pressed her like a suffocating blanket. And the waves of pain surged in her heart but it was at that moment that Maria Callas vanished in that old lady's mind. And the old lady stood alone in her grief. A young man who stood at the gateway of all life's love was wounded and did not suffer the pain of life's blows. That young man had everything, but there was no love in his life, and he was wounded by the wave of dispatch that swept his life to the side. It was when the waves of dispatch destroyed him that the young man who stood at the gate of all love vanished. Every day people ask why the other is suffering like this. The one thing is certain for anyone who loves his life. In this life you will sometimes be wounded by the waves then you will stand alone in your grief. And the waves of life will continue to shake your heart. 
It is what it is. What happens, happens. And as for now, there's nothing you can do. The Regime Revealed is a novel about a British nobleman living on the Gold Coast in 1858, threatened by the spread of slavery to other areas of Africa and the impending annexation of Africa by Britain. Michael Hobbs is an Englishman whose family has been in British possession for centuries. When the British government builds a refinery near his estate, the opportunity presents itself for Michael to live in luxury and to reap great profit. He is much too pleased to accept, not realizing that his decision has far greater consequences. In a confrontation, Michael discovers his cousins and nephew plotting to take over his property in a move that is opposed by powerful members of the British colonial bureaucracy. Michael himself is supported by the Regulator Party, led by the Loyalists, the British Loyalists who wish to preserve their power. A former slave arrives at the refinery as an indentured servant, and is sold to Michael's nephew as a debt to his father. Michael's nephew is also a loyalist, but a part of Michael's plan has gone terribly wrong. His enemies have taken a man as a slave, and Michael's nephew is now guilty of supplying the slave. With the help of the regulator party, Michael is forced to uncover the truth but only after a terrible incident and betrayal. It's not a very good book. Don't read it. The first thing you see when you look in a mirror is the nose, then the eyes followed by the mouth. As we come into this world, the nose, the eyes, the mouth, we are guided and directed by the mother. The mother's mouth talks to us as the father's mouth gives out advice. The mother is the most important, most powerful, and certainly the most beautiful organ in the body. The rest of the body may well become ugly, and it may give itself up to the assault of the disease. But the beauty of the mother is so strong and all-powerful, and it is so large and so infinitely powerful, that the beauty of the mother is manifest to all of us as soon as we come into the world. We see people walking on a motorway as they arrive in town. The person who has gone through the struggle of having a baby stands straight and tall, just like a judge. There are kids smoking and kicking the trash cans on the street outside. It's problem. What about our community? What about me staring at the kids from behind the curtain in my dark living room? What about my strange thoughts as I stare? The patterns, the patterns. My family. They're watching my mom and dad, and I'm scared to make them old. What if I make them old? What would I be? But then I'm pulled out of my contemplation. An interruption. Who's up behind the curtain? Did he just get here? He has an almost blind looking mother in a rocking chair with knitting needles in her hands. 
he's not alone either. A young boy, I think, and as he stares at me with his wide eyes. I realize that this is, in fact, my twin brother, Thomas. The one who made my parents old. I'm happy he's here. He smiles. They're old, he says. I wrote to my senator for the first time ever. The letter was brief, but I told him how much I loved his role in Congress and thought I could really get behind his cause. Afterwards, I realized that I was making a political statement. This was a big step for me, to be political and try to do what I could to change the future of my community. For the first time, I really wanted to get involved. One afternoon in November 2009, I went to a small house in Denver's Northeast Park to meet a man named Mike Williams, a 52-year-old from Vancouver, Washington. Mike had been the first man to challenge the balloon prohibition laws that were being used to prosecute him for owning a green balloon. He lost his appeals, and he was living in fear of being jailed again. Mike had been active in Denver's balloon community for years, and his pleas to change the law had been ignored. He was frustrated and scared that something terrible was going to happen to the, the green balance. I asked Mike about his years of activism, and how he didn't realize that he was an actual balloonist until he was 19. Mike said that he started going to parades because he thought that balloonists in parades were closer to what he was. An outcast. I was impressed with his knowledge of the history of balloon activism in Denver. Mike told me that he was proud of my letter to the governor. He said that he had worked for years to get the balloon community to accept itself. Mike knew that our society had changed to accept balloonists and that it took a lot of work and courage for us to accept ourselves. That night, Mike invited me to dinner at the Bistro Express a popular restaurant in Denver's Northeast Park. During dinner, we talked about our backgrounds. Mike was born to a single mother. His father had disappeared when he was young, and he hadn't talked about him since. I had the same story. My dad died when I was 13 years old. My mother was a school teacher. I grew up with a sister who was a social worker. I was nervous about this dinner. I felt uncomfortable talking about my background. I just wanted to get to know Mike and let him tell me his story. I wanted to show Mike the letter that I had written to Governor Kaufman. When I handed him the letter, I told him that I didn't really want to take him out to dinner, but that he deserved it. It was the first time that I had ever invited another man to go out to dinner. I was nervous that Mike wouldn't want to go, but he told me that he would be willing to go anywhere. He asked me what I was going to do to get the law changed. 
I told him that I was trying to get my state law changed, but that I didn't want him to focus on that. I told him that if he just understood that my efforts to get this law changed were about getting enough attention, then he could stand behind me. After dinner, Mike asked if I would let him read my letter. I agreed. We walked to the entrance of a small park across the street from the Bistro Express. Mike told me that he hadn't wanted to walk in front of the restaurant so he could read my letter from the sidewalk. We had a good laugh about this, as I pointed out that I wasn't really standing in front of the restaurant, but just in front of the newspaper stand that I had put the letter on when I went in. Mike opened my letter and read it. He said that he wanted to read it all. I think that he was embarrassed. I told Mike that I would leave my letter on the park bench for him so he could read it after I had left. This was the day my life started moving. <laughs>